Good afternoon. Welcome to the Don P. Giddens Inaugural Professorial Lecture. I'm Ed Scheinerman. It's a pleasure to be with you here to honor Amitabh Basu, a professor and my colleague in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics. Amitabh is an expert in the fields of optimization, discrete and combinatorial geometry, operations research, and convex analysis. This promises to be a fascinating talk today. Amitabh will be discussing his research about information complexity and how to identify precisely the data needed in order to solve a problem to a desired accuracy. I'd like to take a moment to recognize Don Giddens, for whom this inaugural professorial lecture is named. Don was the fifth Dean of Engineering here at Hopkins and a professor of mechanical engineering. And like Amitabh, his career has been defined by a commitment to both research and education. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Fidel Santosa, uh, the Yu Wu and Cha Mei Chen Department Head and Professor of Applied Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Gerard Cornagels, uh, IBM Professor, University Professor of Operations Research Emeritus at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Professor Cornelius is uh, author of numerous influential papers on combinatorial optimization and books, and has made lasting contribution to the field of discrete optimization. His research has been recognized with several important um, awards, among them the Fulkerson Prize given by the American Math Society and the Mathematical Op Optimization Society in 2000, the George Danzig Prize given by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and also Math Optimization Society in 2009. And uh, the last one was, this, that was the John Neu von Neumann Theory Prize of Informs. This is a Lifetime Achievement Award in Operations Research and Management Sciences, and that was in 20 2011. He was elected to the uh, National Academy of Engineers in 2016. So he has the pleasure of introducing Amitabh, our speaker today. So uh, I guess we're going to show a video of him. Okay. Thanks. It is a great pleasure to introduce Amitabh Basu. Amitabh is a truly exceptional individual. Amitabh was a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, and I had the privilege to be his uh, PhD advisor. I've had uh, several outstanding students over the years, but uh, Amitab is unique. He has the quickest mind of anyone I know, and uh, he's one of the kindest persons in the world as well. He defended his dissertation after only three and a half years. That's a record at CMU as far as I'm aware. Amitabh's dissertation was the basis for at least eight journal papers, I believe, and uh, it provided the material for one of the chapters in the uh, textbook on integer programming that I uh, co-authored with uh, Michele Conforti and uh, Giacomo Zambelli. The uh, collaboration between Amitabh and the three of us was very productive. We spent uh, weeks at my place in Marseille cranking out papers. Michele Conforti would typically get restless around three or four in the afternoon and go for a bike ride, uh, while the rest of us uh, would take a hike on the cliffs above the uh, Mediterranean. I recall Amitabh greatly enjoyed the food, and uh, in fact, uh, gained a few pounds in the process. After leaving CMU, Amitab spent uh, a couple of very productive years at uh, UC Davis, and then he joined Johns Hopkins University. Amitab uh, has won prestigious awards. I will mention the uh, Ballas Prize from the uh, Informs Optimization Society. Amitabh is highly regarded in the profession for his judgment and fairness. He has been program chair of conferences such as MIP 
and uh, chair of prize committees such as the uh, Danzig Dissertation Prize. He's now area editor for uh, discrete mathematics at uh, Math of OR. And I should also mention that Amitab has advised great PhD students. For me, uh, Johns Hopkins is associated with uh, superstars of integer programming. George Nemhauser, B Bill Cunningham, uh, Rico Zanclusen, and uh, Amitabh Basu. Congratulations to Johns Hopkins for its uh, excellent taste and uh, congratulations to uh, Amitabh Basu for his excellent taste. <laughs> um, thanks uh, to Ed, Fadil, and also Gerard for that really kind introduction. <laughs> it's just I know, quite, quite humbling. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, for this for this talk, I I thought I'll talk about uh, a question that uh, I have started working on relatively recently. Uh, but I think it's a fundamental question uh, in the mathematical and computational sciences. And uh, also it is, uh, in my opinion, conceptually and mathematically uh, challenging. And best of all, uh, there's a lot more to do and say, I think, uh, in this question. So, so to motivate the question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about three problems, um, which a priori might seem quite different uh, and disconnected from each other, but I'll try to convince you that there is a important underlying question um, uh, underneath all, all three problems, um, and then uh, talk a little bit more about it. Okay, so the first problem is a so-called vehicle routing problem. So think about Amazon, it has a bunch of uh, packages that its trucks have to deliver. Uh, these packages have to have to be delivered at different locations. Um, there's a certain deadline by which these have to be delivered. Um, and let's say Amazon is interested in minimizing its CO2 impact uh, because of these trucks, or maybe it wants to minimize the fuel costs that it has uh, uh, because of these. And let's say if, if you're uh, deploying drones, then you might want to converse, uh, con uh, conserve battery life. Okay, so um, of course, this is a problem that many, many uh, uh, companies need to solve. For example, UPS or grocery chains like Giant or Safeway. Um, and even uh, when you type, uh, when you use Google Maps to try and figure out the best way to get from Baltimore to New York, for example, we're actually solving some version of this problem. Okay, okay, so that's problem one. Second problem is, uh, is the design of a portfolio of stocks and bonds and commodities and whatnot, uh, so that you want to get some, uh, some amount of expected returns. And given that amount of return, you want to minimize the variance or the risk in your portfolio. So you don't want to have a 10% gain on week one and then minus 15% on week two and then plus 20% on week three. You want kind of a balanced, uh, uh, stable portfolio that kind of gets you a particular amount of returns okay the third problem is something that actually i've uh, i've greatly enjoyed working on um, uh, with a colleague of mine who's present in the audience tomash um, so the problem is the following astronomers like to take pictures of the sky uh, and uh, often they take pictures of the same part of the sky perhaps using different telescopes, or sometimes using the same telescope on different days, under different atmospheric conditions and so forth. So here's an example. This is the picture of the so-called Whirlpool Galaxy, it was uh, discovered by uh, Charles Messier sometime in the 1700s, I think, right, Tomas? Uh, <laughs> uh, the photo is actually from uh, one of uh, the talks Tomas gave at U Chicago uh, a couple of years ago. And so you can see the galaxy, um, its picture has been taken by four different telescopes in different ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the question is that, okay, you have these different images of the same thing, and which star in each image uh, are the corresponding ones to the actual star in the sky, right? So um, if you'll allow me, let's say 
I mean, it looks like maybe something like here in that picture, it corresponds to the same thing that's here, it corresponds to something that's here, something that's here. So you have to figure out, okay, which observation in each picture actually corresponds to which observation in, the, in a different picture. And the uh, problem is complicated by the fact that some objects may actually show up only in certain ranges. So looks like maybe some, some, an object like this actually shows up only in the X-ray region and doesn't really show up here, doesn't really show up. Maybe there's a faint thing in the infrared uh, here, okay? Okay, good. So these are three problems in totally three different domains. So what's kind of common to all of them? Well, uh, it's actually a buzzword that you hear all the time right now, it's data. So what's the question? The question is, so let's look at the vehicle routing problem. You want to route this, so you want to figure out the best way to drive from Baltimore to New York to uh, use the least amount of fuel, for example. Okay, so you certainly need to know the transit times on the different roads and highways, the traffic conditions, etc., to be able to solve this problem. Okay, but you really need to know this for every road in the United States? Not really. I mean, you don't really care about what's going on in California. You probably want to figure out something in a small section of the of the highway connections, right? Okay. Let's look at that portfolio uh, optimization problem, uh, which, which is basically the mean variance problem I talked about from modern portfolio theory from Harry Markowitz. And uh, here again, of course, an important piece of data might be historical stock prices, right? Okay. And the question is, okay, do you need to know the stock prices of every company that's listed on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange? Or maybe you need a subset of those companies do you need it for the last five years, going back 10 years, 100 years? How much data do you really need to be able to solve your problem, okay? And finally, going, coming back to the astronomy question, because if you want to match these observations from different images, one thing you'll probably want to know are the positional information you have on the images, okay? And clearly things that are kind of in the same position in the image should correspond to the same, uh, same object, right? But do you really need to know the positional, exact positional data of all of the observations in all the images? Or maybe you can do away with just a representative number of objects, and then the rest, and you match them, and you figure out, okay, these actually correspond to each other, and the rest, all you really need to know, okay, these are in the top left of the figure, these are in the bottom right of the figure, and then from what you've already figured out, you can match the rest, okay? So it's a, it's a question, how much information do you really need to solve the problem, okay? So given the diverse nature of these problems, hopefully the point I'm trying to make is starting to become clear, which is that if you look at any computational problem, almost any computational problem, let's say you're designing a digital assistant like Siri or Alexa, or you're designing a tool that helps doctors predict whether a certain cancer is gonna stay in remission or not, okay, you have a computational problem. You, that, that piece of software or that algorithm needs to collect data about the problem, okay? If you want to drive from Baltimore to New York, you need different amount of data perhaps compared to if you want to drive from Chicago to Phoenix, okay? So once the method collects this information, it then processes the information to produce a solution up to some desired accuracy, okay? And the fundamental question that I'm trying to sort of tease out is how much information do you need to solve the problem up to this desired accuracy, okay? That's really the fundamental question. And of course, this depends, this answer to this question depends on the actual problem, on the context. And also, just, uh, just, just to point this out, it depends on the accuracy you're interested in. If you're not really interested in very accurate solutions, then you probably don't need that much data. If you just want some route that takes you from Baltimore to New York, probably don't need too much information about the road conditions. But if you want a very accurate solution, you need more data, okay? So it's a, it's a function of not just the parameters of the computational problem you're trying to solve, but also the accuracy you're interested in, okay? 
So to solve this problem, at least from sort of a mathematical perspective, there are two things you want to you want to think about. The one is sort of the engineering perspective. You want to design a method, and you want to show that it works for all the instances or most of the instances in the class of problems you're looking at. And you kind of analyze and say, okay, in the worst case, this method needs this much data. Okay. And every, and if you give it this much data, it'll gonna, it's gonna solve every instance of the problem you're interested in. Okay. That's the engineering aspect of the problem, but there's also a sort of a more philosophical or mathematical aspect of the problem, which is a lower bound where you want to show that, okay, here's a method. And here's the amount of data that it needs to solve the problem in the worst case. And actually no other method can do better than this in the worst case. Okay. And okay. This is of course a nice philosophical question that you can show that, okay, this much data is definitely needed, which also can be useful. So think about the Google engineer who's working on Google maps. Uh, he might want to tell his boss that, okay, here's my algorithm, but there is no way that the engineer in Apple is going to beat this because of this, this reason, my, my algorithm needs this data and Apple cannot do with, with less amount of data. So, so the boss is happy. And so it can actually be useful to prove these lower bounds, uh, even in practice. Okay. Okay. So that's the setup. Um, so now the question is, how do you go about establishing these upper and lower bounds? Well, um, one way to do this, and this is not the only way to do it, but this is sort of my perspective on this, on this question, is to model these things using mathematical optimization tools, okay? And then understand the limits on information you need to solve optimization problems, okay? So let's just, as an example, uh, think about this uh, astronomy problem that I talked about, where you want to match these observations. <clears throat> Here's a sort of uh, simplified example. So here <clears throat> you see some circles, right? And you see some crosses. So think of the circles as images or as observations from telescope one, and think of the crosses as observations from telescope two. Okay, so you might ask, why are there no uh, no observations from both telescopes that are at, uh, that have the same position if they're observing the same object well there's experimental error there's observation error right so even if there's a true object out there in the sky you observe it with some with some noise okay so that's why you don't exactly get the same positions and that's what makes the problem interesting because now if you kind of focus on this little piece here well the question is do you do you say that this circle is the same observation as that cross, and this cross is the same observation as that circle, or maybe this cross is the same observation as this circle, and, and vice versa. Okay, so that's what kind of, and you have to do this for the entire image, right? Okay, so here's one way to kind of attack the problem. Introduce these mathematical variables x i j where i is an index that indexes a circle so it's an image from the first telescope j is an image uh, is an observation in the second telescope and the variable x i j takes the value one if you match observation i in telescope one to observation j in telescope two okay and it takes value zero otherwise okay so Immediately, there are some constraints that you have to worry about. So if you think about, let's say, circle I in the first telescope, it should be matched to only one of the crosses in the second telescope, right? So if you look at all these variables, X, I, one, X, I, two, and so forth, at most one of them should be set to one. So you could add this constraint here that says the sum of these, oops, sorry some of these variables has to be a less than equal to one. Similarly, for every observation in telescope two, it can be matched to at most one observation in the first telescope. So the sum of X one J plus X two J, et cetera, should be at most one. Okay, so those are some constraints that your variables have to satisfy. And what is it that you're trying to do? Well, using certain statistical, uh, 
uh, statistical kind of ideas, you can introduce a weight for every pair. So you can say that, okay, look at um, this cross here and this circle, and there's a weight Wij, which is the likelihood of both of these observations being of the same object in the sky, okay? And uh, clearly these weights will be different. For example, if I consider that same cross and I try to look at the likelihood that these two are the same observation, that's a little less likely, right? So these weights kind of capture how likely it is that two observations from different telescopes are the same thing, right? Um, and then you can kind of look at this expression that I've written down here, which just takes a product of the weights and these variables. So every time you assign some object to another object, you get that weight, right? And you want to maximize this sort of sum. So it's like maximizing some kind of likelihood. And there is, there is some kind of statistical thinking behind this. I'm just, you know, abstracting all of that over. So what have we done at this point? We are saying that, you know, any, any problem like the one that we considered, you can introduce decision variables, y1 to yd now, because uh, I want to use some different variables um, that capture some aspect of the problem that you need to decide on, right? Okay, do, do I take this road or that road? Do I match this observation to that observation and so forth? And then you naturally, because of the nature of the problem, you have some constraints um, that these variables must satisfy. And you want to minimize or maximize some kind of objective, like a likelihood or the fuel cost or whatever it is. Okay. And so now that information complexity question can be asked in this, in this way. I want to solve this optimization problem. I want to design an algorithm that does that. But that algorithm needs to know what functions I, I, I am dealing with. What are my constraints? What are my objectives? What is my objective, right? Um, and of course, if it collects information about these, these constraints and, these, and, the, and the objective, because this was modeled on an actual problem, to get that data, you'll actually have to get the data from your original problem, right? So this is the way how the information of the original data is kind of mapped onto the information of this very precise mathematical question, okay? Okay, so let me just give you a flavor of uh, kind of results you can show about the information complexity of optimization. So there is a very uh, important class of optimization problems where the objectives and the constraints are so-called convex functions. Okay, what are convex functions? If you take a bunch of points, and you take an average of those points, the value at that average point is less than equal to the average of the function values at the original set of points. That's basically what a convex function is. And uh, let's introduce this parameter capital R, which, uh, which, which is just a guarantee that your solution, the optimal solution is contained in a big box of side R or two R, okay? Uh, recall this discussion about accuracy right i want an epsilon accurate solution by that i mean that all the constraints should be violated by at most epsilon and the solution i output its objective value should be at most epsilon more than the absolute best uh, function value that i could have obtained so that's the notion of epsilon accuracy okay you have an assumption of the data that's the context. Yes, absolutely. The absolutely. So, absolutely. Not, not only that, I mean, even assuming that the solutions are always contained in this. So, so that's what I meant when I said that when you prove bounds on the information or the data you need, you actually assume something about the computational problem you're solving. So if you're solving the vehicle routing problem, the amount of information is going to be different from the portfolio optimization problem. And of course, that's gonna reflect itself in the kind of constraints and the objectives that show up. And different classes of constraints and objectives will have different information complexity. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and uh, what are my, what, how, what is the means by which I collect data about the problem? Because I need to know what the constraints are and what the, what the objective is. Well, I'm gonna assume something very simple. At any point, I can ask for the function value 
and I can ask for the gradient. Okay, this is a very standard assumption, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's a nice model for thinking about these problems, um, in 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 a lot of generality. Okay, so the question now arises: How many of these function value and or and gradient oracle queries do I need to make to solve the problem to epsilon accuracy? Okay, and it turns out that there is a very classical result. Uh, which, which gives you pretty tight bounds. It basically says that you need D, where D recall is the number of decision variables you have. It's like the dimension you're working in, times the logarithm of the ratio of capital R and epsilon. Okay, and up to constants, you basically have tight upper and lower bounds, which means that there is an algorithm which will solve the problem with these many queries. And no algorithm can do better than that up to some constant. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a theorem that was established in the in the 1970s by these two Russians, uh, Nemirovsky and Yudin. Okay, let me try to give you a flavor how you uh, uh, how you would prove a result like this. Okay, so good. So I know that my solution is contained in this big box of psi two times r, right? And this is the origin. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask for the function values and the gradients at the center, at the origin. And it turns out from that, I can figure out a half space and guarantee that the optimal solution is on one side of that half space, okay? And then next, what I'm going to do is on the, on the new search space, I'm going to ask for the center of gravity. And this is called the center of gravity method. So I'm going to compute the center of gravity of the new search space. I'm going to ask the same questions. Give me the function values and the gradients. And again, I'm going to be able to generate another half space and reduce my search space a little bit more. Now, here's a, here's a fundamental theorem from convex geometry, which says that if you have any convex set and you look at its center of gravity or its centroid, then any half space that contains it must contain a, a constant fraction of the volume, okay? Which translates to saying that everything that I'm, whoops, everything that I'm actually removing is always like a constant fraction of the original volume, okay? And you, it's not very hard to show that, okay, initially you start with the volume, something like two times R to the D, right? And once you have something that's very small volume, roughly of this order ep, uh, epsilon that I was talking about, then reporting anything in there is gonna be an epsilon accurate solution, okay? So you start with this volume, you end with the volume like this, and every time you're reducing by this constant factor gamma, okay? So let's, so how many times do you have to do it? How many times capital T do you have to do this? Well, it's just basically going to be log of two R over epsilon to the D, which is basically what I was saying. It's D times log R over epsilon, ignoring some constant factors, okay? Uh, how do you show that you need at least these many up to constant factors? Well, Okay, so I, I was supposed to have another blank slide here in which I explain this. So let me try to do this in one corner, which is going to be a little tricky. <laughs> but hopefully the idea comes across. So again, you start with this big box. And you design your method. It's going to query some point and ask for these function values and gradients. Okay. If let's say it's on the right side of this center line. I'm gonna say, actually, there's a constraint that this point you queried violates, and your solution has to be on this side, okay? Then again, your next query, if it's on this side, then I'm just gonna say, sorry, that's a bad point. If you query something out here, then I'm gonna say, look, whoops, it should have been on this side, and every time I can ensure that you only remove at most half of what's remaining in there. And basically that gives you the same matching lower bound. Essentially that's the idea. It's very simple. Okay, there are some technical details you have to work through, but that's the idea. Okay, 
Okay, um, so what's kind of new? So you can ask the same question where you impose some integrality constraints on your decision variables. For example, think about that astronomy question, the x, i, j variables have to take either value zero or one. Giving a value of 0.75 is meaningless for that problem, okay? So you can ask the same question and it turns out that you can prove some new bounds which are not tight, um, but almost uh, up to linear uh, factors in the dimension. So you have something that's exponential in the number of integer variables. And uh, um, I guess I should do it here. So you, you have something that's exponential in the number of integer variables and something that kind of reduces to the original bound um, if you have no integer variables. Okay, and, uh, and the annoying fact is that there is this term that uh, that still creates a gap between the upper and the lower bounds. And it would be nice to get rid of this. That's why I said there are lots of open questions in this area still to be worked out. And this result actually um, is a result of different results I have, uh, I have myself and other, with other co-authors, uh, Tim Ertl, a couple of PhD students, and Marco Molinaro. So this is pretty uh, recent stuff. Uh, I say the 2010s, but actually it was all uh, derived during the pandemic. Um, so in the last couple of years, um, so 2020s, I should update that 2020s. Uh, okay. Um, so that's all I really have on the technical side of things. And now I'm going to switch to the slightly more fun part of the talk, where I get to thank people who helped me on this journey. More fun uh, than so say that again, <laughs> say that again. No? More fun than <laughs> yeah, depends on your perspective, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no questions on the technical side, I'll just keep going. Two questions on the technical side. So you, you've done everything in terms of worst case, right? Yes. What about you know being satisfied with something that works probabilistically the a high percentage of the time? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. So those are much harder. In fact, the standard question in that in that direction is the question of sample complexity in a in any kind of statistical problem. And uh, there are results you can prove on the sample complexity. How many samples do you need to estimate a particular parameter and so forth? But uh, more complicated optim stochastic optimization problems where, let's say your oracle is stochastic, these become very hard to track down. Are there problems where the two answers could be very different? Do you know? That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know of results that actually show there's a dis difference. It's a good question. Well, statisticians have relied on worst case theorems for a very long time and then the end is <laughs> That's true. But Techni I don't know theorems that would answer your question, to be honest. Yeah, that's a good question. And there's also this notion of even if your oracles are still deterministic, you might want to say that, like, you, I think that's what you really meant, that instead of worst case, say that for 90% of the instances in your problem class, you actually get the solution. Those, I think, can still be kind of attacked using similar techniques, but those are also harder. So average case analysis or high probability results, again, are a little bit harder even if you assume your oracles are deterministic. So that's why I say, that, yeah, so I, that's why I say, I think this whole area is kind of completely open and there's a lot to do and think about. Okay, all right. Gerard already mentioned uh, these, three, uh, these three individuals and their impact in my life. I was a PhD student, but Gerard was my advisor. And uh, I am pretty certain that if he had not picked me up as a PhD student, I would have dropped out of the PhD program. I was working on some stuff uh, and uh, my heart was not really in it. And I think if Gerard has not, had not given me the problems that I worked on, I might have just dropped out. But um, I'll say that, yeah, it was all three of them that had the profound influence on my thinking. Michele, for example, I think he's the one researcher amongst all the mathematicians and engineers that I know. He's one guy who I think is 
has this knack for asking really deep and really interesting questions and that I've always tried to emulate later. That, okay, um, you know, how do you ask a good question that kind of makes sense and is also technically interesting and challenging? It's, it's, a, it's a skill that I've learned from Michele, I think. Um, well, I, I, I don't know if I've really learned that well, but Michele is the master. <laughs> Giacomo, uh, he, he, he taught me how to wield the wield the powerful tool of mathematics in an elegant way. So I would, as a PhD student, I would come up with these proofs that were like five or six pages long and Giacomo would just read them and he would come up with like a one page proof and be like, okay, I should have thought of that. And I'd say, it just inspired me to, you know, learn how to write, make the right definition so that everything kind of falls in place. I really learned a lot from Giacomo. Um, after, after, uh, Carnegie Mellon, I moved on to UC Davis for three years as a postdoc and Matthias was my mentor there. And again, he taught me how to be very precise using mathematical language, how to, I appreciated the conceptual underpinnings of math as opposed to the technical underpinnings. Uh, those are sometimes a bit different. I mean, what math means as opposed to how good you are with shuttling symbols are two different things. And Matthias really taught me how to, you know, think uh, conceptually with math. Um, and Jesus, uh, some of you may already know about Jesus. For those of you who don't, let me just share one anecdote. Uh, a while ago, uh, I had just come out of uh, a lecture that Jesus gave, um, and there was another colleague of mine. We were both like starting young researchers at the time. And he said the following, it's, uh, it's al almost an exact quote. Man, Jesus is like one of those preachers in church who's like extolling the virtues of the religion of mathematics. <laughs> and if you, if you sit through Jesus's lectures and don't, co co don't come away wanting to dedicate your life to mathematics, then you're just dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine the impact Jesus has uh, in the lectures, lectures that, he, that he gives. And it definitely rubbed off on me. I mean, I, I, I still retain that you know, enthusiasm and joy of doing math because of Jesus. <laughs> okay, so now it, it's, uh, it's, it's a really, uh, it's a very emotional thing for me to thank the department that I'm in. Um, I, I sincerely feel that of any other department in the country, uh, I could not have developed as a researcher in any other department except this one. So there are some people you don't see here. So let me start with those guys, Ed right here. Uh, he was uh, my mentor uh, as, as a starting faculty, and he had his doors open anytime I needed to ask any questions about anything. Am I doing the right thing? Uh, uh, should I be doing that? Should I be doing this? He was always happy to answer any questions. It was John, who's also sitting in there. John has so much institutional memory here. He knows the answers and the solutions to every problem. <laughs> you can just ask him in the corridor, okay, you know, how should we deal with this? And he has some solutions. Uh, and the people you see here, th these are people I've discussed uh, research a little bit more intensely and I've had collaborations with. Um, Dan, uh, he had an office, unfortunately for him, right next to mine. <laughs> So every morning I would come in and ask him questions. Of, okay, what is an admissible estimator? What in the world is a p-value? <laughs> what is Hardy Weinberg? And, and he would be extremely patient and not just patient. He would be super enthusiastic to explain. Oh yeah, I know this. I'll tell you what this is. <laughs> and it would be ex and so clear. He has he has this amazing view of statistics and probability that he can make things amazingly clear. Uh, to someone like me <laughs> who had zero idea of statistics. And not only that, I mean, Dan and Judy, when we had just moved to Baltimore, they, they invited us for these post Thanksgiving dinners. And those were, those were a highlight of the year for us. Um, and yeah, the pandemic kind of derailed those, but hopefully they'll start up again. Um, then uh, Carrie and Don, uh, I learned a lot about the way statisticians think by discussing things with them. Uh, I've had discussions about Bayesian versus frequentist probability <laughs> with Carrie. Um, I've had lots of interesting discussions <laughs> about learning, uh, learning theory with Don. Um, hope these can continue. Tomas, you already kind of already see, uh, uh, already saw in the slides. He introduced me to what to the wonderful world of astronomy 
in computational statistics. Uh, I counted, Tomash, we already have six papers and one or two in the pipeline. So I, you should keep it going. <laughs> uh, Daniel Robinson, um, some of you may not know him. Um, yeah, he was a fellow optimizer in the department. Um, I learned a lot about areas of optimization I was not familiar with. I was kind of a narrow combinatorial guy when I came in and he kind of showed me uh, the, the fantastic world of nonlinear optimization. And last but not the least, Greg, uh, <laughs> I've discussed quantum foundations and relativity with him. We don't have any papers together, but <laughs> maybe we will sometime soon. These are some other collaborators, of course, because of space, I don't have every collaborator of mine on here. These are people I've really developed some long term research directions with. I would like to point out Joe Mitchell here, who was uh, my master's thesis advisor. So my research journey actually began with Joe um, uh, in Stony Brook University. And without his early support and encouragement, I don't think I'd be here today. So it's definitely a shout out to the PhD, wonderful PhD students that I've had over the years. Um, they, they kept the enthusiasm and the energy going. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, finally, um, I'd like to thank my parents. Um, they, uh, they always made intellectual pursuit the best thing you can do in the household. So it, uh, <laughs> they kind of gave me a a leg up on other kids growing up, I think, um, and they, they formed that environment, which I think is why I continued on in academia. And I will tell you that for any little achievement that I've had, the amount of joy that I have had, they have infinitely more joy, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and last, but definitely not the least, uh, I'd like to thank my wife, uh, Deepti, who was here, but she had to go pick up my daughter from daycare. Um, she she tolerated a lot of my eccentricities and my uh, and my my weird personality <laughs> defects, but mostly I'd like to thank her for the physical absences I had for my conferences and late nights in the office, and more than that, uh, even when I was physically pre present, my mental absences. I remember <laughs> many walks that we have taken, and she has been saying something. And I had relapsed into thinking about an infinite dimensional <laughs> convex set. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm, I'm truly grateful for her support. OK, I'd I like to thank. Uh, I'd like to uh, stop here and thank you guys for listening to me. So thank you, Amitabh. Sure. And congratulations on, on your wonderful thank talk you. and your promotion to full professor. Thank you. Um, we do have a little something for you. Ah, OK. I think we should... Yes, we have to go someplace so we can be photographed. That's right. And... So smile and shake. Look at the camera. OK, great. Congratulations. And please, there's a reception afterwards, and we look forward to you joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.